together there. Okay, we're good. Oh, wow, I got a notice. I did too. That's wild. That's a new feature. <laughs> <laughs> so, just a few housekeeping things. So, a reminder that the YMCA at the city market is still closed, but the Athenaeum, Urse, uh, downtown, and all the other central Indiana Ys are open. And on June 28th, the Shelby County YMCA opens uh, in Shelbyville. So a brand awesome. new YMCA, so awesome. Uh, and as everybody I'm sure is aware and excited, uh, Marion County <laughs> recently lifted the mask mandate. So yeah. members who are fully vaccinated can come into the Y without a mask and fully vaccinated staff are allowed to choose whether or not they wanna wear a mask. So. We're not, no longer going to have masks required uh, for classes or mask hours like we have been having uh, for the past while. So life is slowly but surely getting back to normal. Uh, yay. BG, yay! BGIA at the City Market is still open Tuesday through Saturday, 10 to 4, uh, closed on Sunday and Monday but the other BGI locations are operating at normal uh, business hours. So go, go forth and uh, visit and buy bikes and uh, bike appurtenances because you probably can't buy bikes <laughs> for a while. <laughs> But uh, upcoming Lunch and Learn. So uh, July 8th, mark it on your calendar, is bike security and bike maintenance. Uh, Jamie McPherson's doing that. And then August 12th is biking in the community. So that's more bike advocacy and stuff. Uh, so that'll be a good one to uh, attend as well. And then on September 9th, is encouraging diversity on bikes. So uh, it's gonna be another panel discussion where we're talking about uh, increasing diversity. So uh, very exciting topics coming up. So mark your calendars and attend. So I wanna thank all the folks that are on the call today. Uh, Damon is going to be kind of leading the discussion and the conversation, but I wanted to introduce uh, our panel members. Or Damon, do you want to do that? I was going to let them do it themselves. So okay, knock then yourself out. I'll, I'll let you just go ahead and take it over. Okay. Okay. Um, Indianapolis is a city that's about 400 square miles in area. And to give you a gauge, that's bigger than New York City, that's bigger than Dallas, bigger than San Diego, and even Houston. It's only slightly smaller than Los Angeles or Phoenix. Within that 400 square miles, we have over 8,000 lane miles of streets. Then that doesn't include interstates or state highways. That's just uh, roads that our Department of Public Works is responsible for. So that means that we're really spread out and the distances of our trips tend to be long. That makes alternate transportation options a little more difficult. But today we're gonna talk to some people who have made that transition from totally car dependent to a little car less uh, or car free or car light, or however you want to describe that. Um, and so we're going to have four people because I'm playing player coach today. So I get to be on the panel too. Uh, four folks who are going to talk to you about their transition from car dependent to less car dependent and some of the things that happen along the way and maybe surprise them. Um, and since I'm player coach, I get to go first. <laughs> I, um, gosh, it's been three years ago now that I told my wife we didn't need to have two cars and she flipped the lid. And so we agreed to experiment. We parked my car in the garage for a year and we counted how many times I had to use my car in that year. And the agreement was if it was six or less, then I could get rid of my car. And in that year, I used my car four times. So got rid of it. Um, that transition happened for me almost by accident. Um, in a previous fight with my wife, we argued about moving. And I told her I would only move if we moved downtown. And she didn't want to move downtown. But finally, she agreed to that. We moved downtown. And 
suddenly everything was close to me. It was a three block walk to work and it was a half mile walk to the grocery store. And I, it just, everything changed because my, my trips got shorter. Uh, you'll hear that theme a lot. Um, and so over the years of being downtown and using my car less and less, I started thinking about how much money I was spending for that car that was just sitting parked and decided finally I needed to make the move to get rid of it. Um, I, I ride a hybrid bike most of the time when I'm doing uh, commuting kinds of activities. I have a couple of really cheap Pannier bags that I hang on the back that can carry two bags full of groceries and that kind of stuff. And that's how I get around. Um, I put my bike on the bus sometimes when I'm going a little bit farther and that's not been a problem. It's a super deal for me because I'm a veteran. So I'll ride the bus for free. Uh, um, and so that, that's kind of my story. That's, that's a transition. And surprisingly now, you know, we've been downtown for eight years and my wife is starting to use the car less as well. And without me pushing her to do it, it's just sort of naturally starting to happen. So I'm looking forward to the day when she says, you know, maybe we don't need a car at all. Uh, I may be dead before then, but I'm kind of hoping. So that that's my story, my transition from being a two-car family who drove a lot. And, and literally, before we moved downtown, I would put 25,000 miles a year on my car. Um, and that went almost to zero over the course of the four years that we lived downtown before we started the conversation. So it's, it was an interesting transition, but it took me completely by surprise. Okay, now I'm gonna to move to Cassie Stockham. And Cassie, I want you to introduce yourself and just tell your, your transition story. Oh goodness, my story. So this, I think I've been car less for over six years now. And um, at the time I was president of, of CERTA, Central Indiana Regional Transportation Authority and chair of a couple other organizations, just becoming more and more aware of climate change and, and the impact that that we all have and realizing the two biggest things that we as individuals can do is change how we eat and change how we, we move around. And so I had started to say it out loud to my friends, I'm gonna sell my car, I'm gonna sell my car. And it took me a while <laughs> to get the courage up candidly because I too found myself dependent on this crazy transportation in the city. So I live in Broad Ripple and work downtown. It was six miles. It seems like nothing now, but back then it was, it was a thing. So when I heard that Blue Indy was coming to town, that was a catalyst for me because I thought that would be something that I would use when I needed a car. And in fact, I did use it, but pretty much only to get to the airport. <laughs> and I think Damon, just, uh, he said things that surprised us. That was one thing that surprised me is I hardly ever used Blue Indy. But it was something in the back of my mind that was always there and available to me. So when it obviously went out of um, business a couple of years ago, it that didn't impact me at all. Things that surprised me, continue to surprise me and still surprise me to this day are being involved in this shared economy. When people heard that I had uh, let go of my car, people came to me and said, you can borrow my car anytime you need it. It's available. And I took them up on that. I would leave the car clean and full of gas. It was a win, win, win. They had an asset that was sitting there underutilized and I rarely needed it. I still probably need a car twice a month. Um, and I have a daughter in Bloomington, so I would go down to see her or her parents up in Columbia City. But I then just transitioned to my bike and I um, am physically stronger, healthier, thousands of dollars of savings a year. It's shocking the amount of money that I was just able to put into this, this retirement account. That, um, that's, it's, a, it's amazing. So, and um, I took a crazy big trip, came back and I, the friend that I had borrowed, Bob Schloss, you know, <laughs> Damon knows Bob very well. Um, he had sold his car out from underneath me and he was always a very gracious contributor. So I put something out on Facebook and I said, hey friends, I'm renting a car occasionally from Enterprise. I'd much rather pay a friend that money than, than Enterprise. And people came out of the woodwork. In fact, one friend said, please, please pick me, pick me. I have a car that has 1200 miles on it. It's sitting and needs to be driven. Perfect. It, it, again, these things are just 
the synchronicities work. So um, I will hopefully never own a car again. Um, paying attention to where I live and being close to a bus line, being close to transportation, it's real. It's, it's very, very real. And my Paneers, I mean, I too go to the grocery store. People laugh at me in the middle of winter. I'm, I mean, I'm pretty selective on the days I go and don't go, obviously. It's not the easiest thing here sometimes, but it's built resilience in me that I, I frankly didn't, didn't always know that I had. So I learned to bundle up. I started off, I put together a spreadsheet. I think David and I had talked about this just with a graph of all my body parts on one side and, and 10 degree increments on the other and what I needed to wear. And now it's just, it's just intuitive, but I had to think about it pretty consciously back then. And the other thing I always love to encourage people is that I'd rather stop, start off cold than start off overheated. That's miserable, being sweaty on a bike. Ugh. So there, that's, that's what I can share. Just do it. <laughs> Great, thanks. We're, we'll come back and we'll do some Q and A when everybody gets done with their story. Uh, Trent, I'm gonna move to you next. Yeah, I started biking again back in, I put it up on my emails, 2013, BGI in the city of Indianapolis had a get back on your bike program. <clears throat> so that's when I, I joined that challenge. Um, I, I enjoyed like the kind of competitive with coworkers and stuff aspect of it too, with the national bike challenge each year. Um, back when you could like compare yourself with your friends a lot more easily. Um, but I would ride mostly commuting to work back and forth. I live on the east side. So it's about five and a half, six miles, depending on which route I take. Um, and it's also like I'm terrible about like taking time to like go exercise for the sake of exercising. So like riding my bike to work is it's about like 30, 40 minutes each way of like exercise I wouldn't be getting otherwise. Um, the pandemic working from home for a year kind of hurt that, but we're, we're starting to go back in again. Um, I ride, um, like a converted touring bike. I converted it to be more like upright for like city riding. And I have a cargo bike that I can use. And I like finding like, kind of like challenging things that I can do with my cargo bike. Like I've taken, uh, a car tire with the wheel on it on, to, um, or a car wheel with the tire on it to um, get the tire fixed on my cargo bike. I've carried like a giant bed, bed frame, queen size bed frame that can fold in half to Goodwill that we weren't using anymore. Um, I like to ride, I, when I occasionally have a concert I'm playing in within biking distance of home, like I'll load up my instruments and ride ride to my concert. <clears throat> During the pandemic, I was doing a lot of the like click list on Kroger where you can order ahead of time and then they let you ride your bike and just load it up in the parking lot. So I was doing that too. Um, yeah, that's most of, most of my riding, occasionally just like for fun in the neighborhood, but I usually have to like have a specific destination to get motivated to go ride somewhere. That's an interesting uh, note that you make there. I have found that people who become bike commuters tend not to ride for recreation anymore because they're getting all the exercise anyway while they're going back and forth to, to whatever they're doing. It's interesting you brought that up. It wouldn't hurt um, me to ride more, but I just usually don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Silva, tell us your story. Silva, Silva's a, a repeat as she did last month's Lunch and Learn solo. So your turn, Silva. Yeah, last week I was talking about family biking and that definitely connects to cargo for me. Um, I think the thing that pushed it over the edge to get a cargo bike uh, was having two twins um, and then finding that having to get them out of, like have them in their car seats and bring them into the door and the parking lot is really far it was just such a headache. And then when, so I used to take them to play and learn at the YMCA. And so like the parking wasn't even that far. It was like right there next door at the time, but still like getting the sliding doors open and getting them and trying to carry two baby car seats in or try to carry two babies upstairs and in so I could get a workout was so much harder than pulling up to the bike rack by the door. 
getting my two babies out, going up the steps and I'm there. Um, so I, I think I come from a convenience standpoint where if you are in a dense downtown area, uh, it actually is faster and easier to ride a bike. Um, my parents, I grew up in Bloomington and my parents were still living there when we first came to Indy. And they would say, uh, well, we need to drive to dinner, even though our bikes are being stored in your garage, because we got to get back home to Bloomington. Uh, we don't have a lot of time. Uh, so like, let's drive to Mass Ave for dinner together. And I'd say, it'll, it'll be faster to bike. And they'd say, no, no. And so I said, okay, let's split up. We'll bike there and you drive there. And they were still circling around looking for parking while we were already seated, having our first drink. Um, so I think when you have a city that is designed for it as Indianapolis is becoming increasingly uh, a, a great spot for biking, it really is easier instead of harder. And I think that was surprising to me that it wasn't like an extra more difficult thing to do, but actually my cargo bike is much more convenient than a vehicle for almost all of our daily activities. Um, I think I feel pretty strongly that like there are things in my life, like getting to live downtown that are, are privileges that I have that allow that and that I want to see that come to more of the city so that everyone can have that experience because I know that it's not really available to everyone in the way that I enjoy bike commuting. Um, so I think there's a lot of work to do there. Um, but compared to when I lived in Los Angeles and I would just sit in my car and cry after getting stuck on the highway for two hours trying to go six miles. Uh, I just knew when we moved to Indy that I wanted a smaller geographic circle for my life that I didn't want to play that game anymore. And it turned out to be just a real joy to be able to leave the car entirely. I sold my Honda Fit in 2019 in the summer to buy my Urban Arrow and I have not looked back. Very good. And that, it's interesting because uh, sort of a piece of that is whether you did it consciously like you did or unconsciously like I did, right now to, to reduce your use of car requires you to make some conscious decisions about where you live and where you work, uh, be convenient to a bus line like Cassie talked about, or sh shrink your circle to something that is, you know, five or 10 mile radius. Now I do, I go longer rides for sure. Um, and about the only thing I haven't figured out how to do with my bicycle is to take my hundred pound dog because uh, I, I have a, a dog trailer and he fits in it. But if we're riding along and he sees a squirrel and decides he's going after it, me and the bike and the trailer are going after that squirrel too. So. I still have, that's probably the primary use for the car is when I have to take Lucas somewhere. Um, so that's interesting. Um, talk before I let you go, Silva. You talked about choosing a cargo bike, but you have a whole lot of bike experience and knowledge. So choosing a cargo bike wasn't just like, oh, I think I've got a cargo bike. For, for a lot of people, they said, and I'm gonna come back to you on this too, Trent. For a lot of people, they're like, I don't know if I have the right bike for this. Mm. So talk a little bit about that. It's funny. I actually, I think because of twins, I kind of push towards what I consider like the Apple, like it's the iPhone of bikes. Like everything just kind of comes in the same kit and you don't have to like add and install things to get your basic experience. It works together. It's like expected behavior. Um, and it's, uh, it has electric assist. I found this on the web. Oops. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's, it's definitely, it's more bike than I need now that my kids are older. Like I think when I had two kids under three and, or two kids under two, when I started, there were just so many other moving parts to my life that I needed like a complete package that was simple and like ready to just go at any given time. And now I'm like, oh, this is like way more bike than I need. Like, I think just like a basic back fiats would be good. Or like, I've, I've been looking into like slings where you can actually just like tie things onto your regular bike. There's like special, like well-designed kits for that. There's a lot of options 
um, that you can really dig into and explore. And starting out, if if you like just get a rear rack and throw a couple panniers on it, you can do a ton of things. Um, just yeah. having a little bit of extra space that makes your bike, instead of just you out on a ride getting some exercise, it's like, oh, cool. Like I can bring this thing I need to do, or I can grab a couple groceries on the way home. Just, it kind of opens up your options where your um, bike behaves more like what we expect our cars to like, oh yeah, of course I would like have my coffee in my bag or um, have a cup holder, like making some of those changes that fit uh, whatever your needs are. And that, that's, I mean, that's still what I'm doing. I have a, a rear rack and a couple of painters and I, I tell people all the time, they're the cheapest painters I could find when I bought them. Uh, but they don't carry two bags of groceries. So I go to the store when I need two bags of groceries worth of stuff, uh, which means a little more often than probably most people do, but uh, it keeps my house in fresh fruits and vegetables. So that's nice. Um, Trent, you, you've done some modifications and additions to your bike. You talked about hauling a car tire off to the shop. But you've built your own painters and uh, all kinds of connection things. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I got, uh, well, I sort of ripped off the design just from like seeing other other sling bags, like you mentioned sling bag, Silva. Um, and it's basically like a big pannier, but it doesn't have like, it's not like a sealed bag. It's more like a, like a taco shell kind of thing. So it's adjustable, like you can fit larger stuff in it um, or you can shrink it with the straps to make it sm as small as you, you know, smaller. And I did build some like end flaps on it to make it be able to close up like a more regular bag so I can carry grocery bags and stuff. Um, that was one of my like pandemic hobbies was <laughs> making that. Um, yeah. And I, I've noticed with like my cargo bike, it's, it's always like a trade off, like whether, that's why I want to have like still a smaller, like normal size bike too. Cause if you have, if you have a cargo bike, it's too big to fit on the bus racks. So if you <sighs> tire and normally, or, you know, anything goes wrong where you could normally put your bike on the bus and like go the rest of the way, you don't have that option with the larger cargo bike. But then on the other hand, it's nice because where I live, like it's a little bit further to get to the grocery store. And if you're, if you're busy after work with stuff, it's hard to go more often. So I like to, the ability to get all the stuff I need in one trip. And so like, that's a nice thing about the cargo bike. You can just load it up with um, pretty much all the stuff. Like I've carried large bags of dog food on the front rack, um, giant like rolls of paper towels and toilet paper just anything I would need for you know a week or two and I've I've got a flat tire again right now and I haven't changed it yet so I've been using my smaller bike lately and I had to go to the store and get a few things the other day and I had to remember like okay I've got to get the smaller <laughs> side of this because I won't be able to carry it home <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's there's a trade-off but it's nice having having the options hey Damon okay. so you, you guys are talking about uh, cargo bikes. Are you talking about a bike that has like a trailer attached to it or what, what is a cargo bike? Well, in, in the case of Trent and Silva, they're completely different. Trent's bike looks like an, a bicycle with a really extended rear rack on it. So it's got a longer wheelbase, but it looks like a traditional bicycle only longer. So if you thought of like, you know, uh, sedan versus a minivan kind of thing. Uh, Silva is driving a semi. <laughs> her, her bicycle has a giant like bathtub between the seat and the handlebars and that's where she puts her kids and so uh, cargo bikes come in lots of different shapes and sizes. Um, I, if I thought about it I'd ask everybody to get a picture of their bike so we could have shown them because th there's a big variation between what Trent rides, what Silva rides, what I ride and even what Cassie rides are all completely different looking bikes, but we've all adapted them to fit our needs. Um, and, and what I want to get back to, I'll go back to Cassie. It's Cassie and I were talking one time when she had just started doing this. So Cassie, talk about how becoming, a, the bicycle becoming your primary thing changed the way you ride in traffic. 
Oh goodness. Yeah. That's, that's a great question. Um, I've learned to ride big. <laughs> my, I, I, I puff up my back. I have my elbows out and I talk a lot. <laughs> I talk to riders. I talk to drivers. I will not cross the street unless I catch an eye or I get a motion from someone. So I have learned to be defensive and yet aggressive. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I've learned how to time. I can tell cars that are speeding that aren't, I can not tell by the sound of a car slowing down or who's revving up. Um, yeah, I definitely have, have learned how, and I'm much more confident, right? I'm probably riding 6,000 miles a year. So just when you've got time in the seat that much, it's become such second nature. Yeah. And the, I have two bikes. The bike that I use mostly around the city is a 20, over a 20 year old Nishiki, that old steel bike. It's, it's a workhorse. Oh my gosh. And then I, um, for my touring, I, I have a, just a Raleigh. I don't have any high, really high end expensive bikes. They just, it's not necessary, right? It just carries us where we need to go. So, yeah. but the racks are my, my thing that helped really change the ability to carry and, and to do whatever I needed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do we have any questions? No questions. Such a quiet group. Okay. Um, I was talking a little bit about the future. Um, our city is becoming more bicycle connected and that provides the ability for more people to make those choices. And with the rewriting of our zoning codes, it makes it a little bit easier to build communities where the things you need to get to are closer. But again, like I said, you know, Indianapolis is 400 square miles. It's gonna take a while to, to build a completely connected bicycle network, which is why I wanted Cassie to talk about uh, riding with traffic. If you are going to try to become less car dependent, you've gotta become more confident at riding in traffic because somewhere on that journey from point A to point B, you are more than likely gonna to have to share the road. You're not gonna be able to do it all on bike lanes or bike trails. Um, and, and Dave, I'm and gonna interrupt for a second. I think you sure. were the one that taught me is that it is okay to take a whole lane. When it is tight and people are, are appearing like they're gonna pass me and there's oncoming traffic, I will take that lane to protect myself. And I know it pisses them off, but I'm okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I love it when uh, I see you going down Mass Ave right in the middle of the street. <laughs> yeah, that's something being a mama bear has taught me too, where if I need the lane to feel safe, then I definitely take it and I feel no regret about it. And I think all cyclists should feel that way. But I think having the kids with me has helped me to become more confident in owning that like no right now this is my section of road and you i'm going like 18 miles an hour that's plenty for downtown since our speed limit is 25 and uh you can wait until i navigate this intersection or this stretch and it's okay that people sometimes are slightly slowed down by cyclists like the roads are right. for everyone and and the reality is in the in the urban core we don't slow them down because those guys who get all hot under the collar and then zoom around you, you're right behind them at the next stoplight. Okay, anything else? Um, no I wanna to just let folks know that we have Bicycle Garage Indy has become a turn dealer, which, um, so we are going to be carrying turn cargo bikes and we cool. have one at our downtown store. Mm -hmm. um, we also have the, the one thing that we didn't really talk about here that also can be a game changer for people are e-bikes um, because mm -hmm. the, sometimes the distances are a lot farther than people might, might be able to go. Now, Silva did mention that she has an e-assist cargo bike, um, but some people have been using e-bikes um, or pedal assist bikes for their commuting and it expands how far and how often that they can ride. Um, so that's, uh, we have lots of e-bikes as well at, at all of our stores. Um, but that's, that's, 
that's a good point, Connie, because not only do e-bikes extend a distance, but for a lot of people, in fact, I talked to a guy just the other day, he said he wants to commute, but he doesn't have any place when he gets to work to clean up. So we feel like if he gets an e-bike, then he, the amount of effort to get his e-bike to work will not leave him drenched in sweat when he gets there. So that, that is a really good point. Thanks for bringing yeah, one of the things yeah. with e-bikes, however, and with all biking for transportation um, is to make sure that you have a secure place to park your bike. Right. Um, and I think that's even more the case right now because bikes are fairly difficult to get. And so there's more apt to get stolen. Mm -hmm. So make sure you have a really secure place to park your bike or you have a really secure lock. U locks are what you need. Cable locks don't do it. And that's a good lead into next month's topic because Jamie's going to talk about that. And or you can do a silver did you buy bike that's as big as a car and you don't have to worry about anybody taking it. <laughs> Damon, since we're talking about that really quick, can I mention the where how people can find where to park their bikes? Oh, sure. So right now you can search on the Google Maps app like bike parking or bike racks um, and then just zoom in to like the block where you want to go and click search this area and it should show where all of the bike racks in Marion County are located. Uh, and there should be um, pictures of the bike racks at most of the locations now. So you can kind of see what the surroundings are like, see what the condition of the bike rack itself is. If it's the old kind, they call it old wheel bender schoolhouse style where I think they're kind of useless because you can take with tools, you can remove the wheel and steal the rest of the bike. Um, or if it's like the more modern kind that's secured to the ground and you can lock your frame to it. So that's that's a tool there so people can see what options there are for parking before you leave and know ahead of time. And maybe, maybe there's not a bike rack at the business you're going to, but there is a good bike rack like across the street or somewhere next door that isn't too far to walk from. So you can kind the trend of- do, So in the Google map, in the Google maps, I just type in bike parking. Bike, bike parking racks. or bike rack, yeah. yeah. Really, I didn't know up. that. Oh, that's that, awesome. That's, I'll, okay. I'll, thank you. To Trent's horn for him, Trent has almost single-handedly done that project of collecting bike. And they probably aren't all there. So if you come across one that isn't there, uh, you can send an email to Indy Bike Parking at bikeindianapolis.org to get it added on. Um, and I got yeah. the idea from Ronald, Ronald Cooper's Instagram hashtag Indie Bike Parking. Right. But also, in, in most cases, if you're wherever you're going, if you got there by bike, they'll let you bring your bike in. Uh, I, I, I don't even ask anymore. I just go in with my bike and hardly anybody ever says, hey, you can't come in here with that. Except, except the transit Sul center for, downtown. Yeah, and Sullivan Hardware. <laughs> oh, no, no. Uh, Fusic hardware. But most places will let you bring your bike in. I even take my bike into the bank. They kind of laugh because they see me coming. And it's like, hey, come on in. They run out and open the doors for me. Um, so it, it's worth asking if you're going to commute to work. It's certainly worth ask, asking your employer about bringing your bike in to the office and maybe investing in some place to get cleaned up. Um, I worked at the phone company, we wanted a shower and the powers that be said no. So we just found a janitor's closet and converted the little mop sink into a shower by putting up a shower curtain and a hose. <laughs> Off we went. And then the janitor was really confused the next week. <laughs> he didn't mind at all. <clears throat> so, all right, so that's our presentation unless some of the panelists got something else to throw in or somebody's got a question to ask. I didn't see any questions in the chat. We can't hear you, Silva. In case we end up with some people new to the idea of um, biking for transportation and watching the video, 
uh, the point about sweat and e-bikes is actually also just a great point about the rack as well. So today, uh, I my Pacers Bike Share uh, membership has expired, and I was planning to borrow a bike and bike pack from downtown because I had walked down with my kids earlier and then met my husband and complicated connections. But uh, walking home with a backpack on, just walking, which I do all mm -hmm. the time, I got so sweaty because I usually never have to actually wear my backpack beyond like from where I parked into a building because it's in my cargo space uh, right. or it's on the rack. So if you're a new biker watching this video and you are looking for uh, a way to feel better getting to your destination without feeling sweaty and gross, the rack makes a huge difference. Getting that off your back where it's not trapping heat um, and banging around or even causing back pain, having it on the bike and letting the bike be the workhorse feels so good. That's yeah, a good point. I, yeah, I ended up getting collapsible uh, side baskets or whatever for the back of my bike so I could put my uh, backpack in there or I could put, you know, go to the farmer's market and put stuff in there and bike at home. Mm -hmm. I have one of those little stretchy nets with the hooks on it. And that I put my bike, my backpack on the rack and cover it with that net. So it's not causing me to sweat as I ride along. And so there's the things that you just kind of start doing and you don't even think about them. They're just like, wow, this is way more convenient. I'm going to do that. Damon, what's the net thing? I don't have that. I just have freezing. Oh, it's, it's, it's like a big cargo net. It's, Ooh. you know, just hashed, yeah. but it has hooks on all sides. Oh. So you can sort of cover anything and then just stretch the hooks to connect to the oh. rack. Where, where so do I find that? Bulky stuff. Where do I find uh, you one? Can probably, you, you can probably get one at a hardware store. Okay. Um, okay. Good. Thank you. You bet. Yeah, I have one of those nets as well. And I have a couple different panniers, different types of panniers, depending on what I'm going to have in a rack back. And so... When my husband and I go on a tandem ride, we have my panniers on and our rack pack and our, our trunk pack holds our cold <laughs> beverages. So when we're done with our bottle, then we have a nice cold insulated cold thing to, um, to drink and, you know, exchange our bottles. And then I carry my camera and I always go on photo bike rides. So now I just take that, um, take my panniers with my camera. Mm -hmm. I haven't had, I don't remember the last time I ever carried anything on me. It's always yeah. been on the racks in panniers or, and I have one of those nets as well. Um, just because, you know, why should I carry it? My bike can carry it. Mm -hmm. Now I do still wear a jersey with pockets. I love those pockets. I wish they made dress shirts with those pockets in the back because it's really- They don't convenient. even use pockets on jerseys. Everything goes on the bike. Oh, I, 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 put, I don't I put, put anything in my pockets. <laughs> I, I don't need pockets on my jerseys. And I, I also have a little top tube bag. Uh, some, some people call them bento box uh, bags. And that's where I keep like snacks so I can munch while I'm riding. Um, but yeah, you just, you just start discovering these things that you can add on and makes your ride a little more convenient. And I love when people share. Like I tell people, Cassie, that, that cargo net, it's a wonderful thing, but you need to have enough time to disentangle it from itself every time you use it because it, it all gets intertwined and the hooks get caught. For a long time, I just kept mine on my rack. Ah. Then, I, then I didn't I keep, have to untangle it. Yeah, I use see. those nets to hold stuff inside my basket too. Ah. Well, there you go. Amazon and don't forget if you shop on Amazon, you can do Amazon Smile and designate Bike Indianapolis as Ooh. the recipient of the donation. Thanks for the plug. Yeah. Kroger has I just, to rewards. I just remember to do that this year. Hmm. Okay, Sarah, we're done. We're giving it back to you. I, I've got nothing else. So thank you guys for uh, joining and uh, 
we'll send out the link to the uh, recording. So I appreciate all the panelists and Damon for you facilitating everything and all you uh, folks for joining. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Well, we'll see, see you all, all next, next month. month. See ya.